you know, you're a spectator who is watching the decision making unfold between two players, and it, it's more methodical than when I'm playing myself. Yeah. Um, I just was able to see things that I just can't see when I'm currently playing, and it was like scientific. I don't know. I really liked it. it, it it's fascinating because I've had the same experience when I when I commentate StarCraft. But... Hey, everybody. Uh, before we start this podcast, I want to give you guys a quick update on the coronavirus situation out here in Korea. Uh, it does look like things are actually getting better. Um, as the test results are coming in every day, it seems like the number is getting lower and lower. So this is, uh, as they would say, flattening the curve. It seems like the government's been doing a really good job, at least in my experience and the other people I talk to about handling this. Uh, so that's good. Um I've been following the news in the U.S. I get all the U.S. news cable channels, and um, it's fucking crazy, man. Uh, I hope you guys are okay down there. Um, again, I think what's most important for people is to just stay indoors as much as possible, to wash your hands, to try to not touch your face, um, and hopefully this thing gets sorted. It's going to be really interesting to see how the U.S. handles this, especially considering um, you know the healthcare situation already in the U.S. is, is pretty... Um, pretty not good. So um, I, I, I'm rooting for you guys. I hope everything turns out okay over there. Um, and we still have the travel ban going on over here. So I think we're banned from flying to, I think, a little bit over 100 countries right now. So thank God I went to Evo early and got this interview. We have several more Evo interviews. This is from Evo Tokyo um, a month ago. Uh, this interview is with Vicky Kitty. If you're unfamiliar with Vicky Kitty, uh, she is an excellent Smash Ultimate commentator. Uh, when I got a hold of her, it was in between uh, her casting sessions. So she had a cast earlier that day. She was on break. She was nice enough to come back and do a quick interview with me. And then she had to go right back out and start casting again. So I was a little bit crunched on time, but I thought this interview went really well considering. Um, so I really appreciate her taking the time to sit down and talk with me. As a quick reminder to everybody, we have upgraded the podcast to video. Uh, you can go to our YouTube page to find that there. Uh, this is not the studio recordings we normally do. This was recorded in my hotel room in Tokyo uh, because obviously this was done overseas in Japan. Um, uh, if you're use if you're somebody who just watches this uh, on YouTube, I would also encourage you to go ahead and check us out on Spotify and iTunes. Uh, it's generally intended that this podcast is digested in an audio format but we do have video format now as well for those of you who want to watch at home uh, if you guys appreciate the work we're doing here at the tasteless podcast you can support us at patreon.com forward slash tasteless podcast and now for our interview with vicky kitty okay thank you for doing this of course um how's your evil been so far Amazing, honestly. It's the, I've been to Evo in Las Vegas plenty of times, but this is my first time in Japan, so being able to experience the culture here and see the scene for what it is, the people that aren't able to travel as often, it's just a completely different experience, so I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, thanks again for doing this. I know you're casting today. Um, yeah. How did you get into casting? So it's funny because, you know, usually when you get into a competitive scene, that's not the first thought that comes into your mind, like, hey, I want to talk about this game on camera. Uh, it usually stems from wanting to compete and be a competitor yourself. So I've been playing Smash my whole life. Uh, I grew up as a single kid um, until I was roughly like eight years old. My little sister was born. So to keep the time, you know, filled up, I basically would just play a bunch of Smash with CPUs. And um, as I got older, Smash Brothers kind of stuck with me between Melee, Brawl, and of course, until the Wii U version came out, um, I didn't know about the competitive scene at all. Until I went into a local land center and I saw a Smash tournament happening and I absolutely fell in love with the scene there. Like everyone was super which, which friendly. Which Smash was this? Uh, for Wii U. Okay. Yeah, the Smash 4. And everyone there was so nice that I wanted to go back. It was honestly the community that made me want to come back. Um, and I had this drive that was uh, as cringy anime-esque, like <laughs> wanting to get better. I wanted to be the best, essentially. Yeah. Like... Um, if I had to run like a Naruto intro going on. That was literally like what my 18 year old <laughs> self was just like, all right, I'm about this. Um, it was a hobby that I essentially started taking a lot more serious. I've been playing games my whole life, but never competitively like that. Funny enough, the first game I picked up was a uh, Counter Strike. I was like three years old, and it was oh really? Which, which Counter Strike then? Was that a uh, Source or? <laughs> it had to have been like 1.6 late 90s, early okay, 2000s. So. 
That, that was probably source then. Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah, I grew up on 1.6. I'm it, a little bit older than you. Forever but, ago. Yeah. I just, it was my dad's, and my dad's yeah. really young, so he was into that type of stuff. And um, I guess that was, it's kind of what sparked my competitive nature, just being the best. I always thought I was pretty good at it, so I would kind of like sneak on there because I wasn't allowed to play the game, you know, guns yeah. and stuff like that. I'm like a little kid. <laughs> And um, that competitive side never went away when I got older. So taking Smash seriously, um, I had this strong drive of just being better than anybody else. And uh, that drive con- persisted until one day our tournament organizer at the event was like, Hey, Vicky, come on, uh, come on, come in the Tia room and like commentate with me. I was like, yeah, I, I guess. Like, I mean, I kind of saw it as watching the projector that was currently in the land center and just the way I would discuss it with my friends around me just yeah. on, you know, in a seat with a camera on. So I went in there, we we jammed it. It was amazing. Um, There was like 500 people that were watching a local, which isn't really a thing that happened in Smash 4. Um, Viewership wasn't as amazing as it is currently for Ultimate. So I got amazing feedback and I, I honestly had a lot of fun with it. I like to talk a lot and I talked about the game that I currently was playing a lot too so it kind of was like you know why not I didn't take it as a serious career at the time I kind of saw it more as a learning experience for the game I was able to see situations that I would not be able to see while I was playing hands-on can't really describe it I guess it's kind of like a you know you're a spectator who is watching the decision making unfold between two players and it's more methodical than when I'm playing myself yeah Um, I just was able to see things that I just can't see when I'm currently playing. And it was like scientific. I don't know. I really liked it. it, it it's fascinating because I've had the same experience when I when I commentate StarCraft that if I'm forced to talk about the game out loud and think about the two players and what they're trying to do, I see it in a totally different way than if I'm just grinding by myself. Yeah, I, I feel I don't know what it could be. I feel like it's just honestly seeing the decision making <laughs> unfold and uh, seeing the different choices that that person has and the choices that you probably won't take, but they would. It opens up your mind into the possibilities of what could happen when you're put in a situation where you're either cornered or, you know, you have to play more offensive. Um, And I really like that. So my first event was that was that happened in October of like 2015. My first event of commentating, I was like already thrown into the Sharks was like about a month later. And it was not a small tournament. It was a regional. Was that scary at all? I mean... People are more afraid of public speaking than death. <laughs> I, I heard mean, actually a statistic yeah. that yeah. people people would rather die literally than talk in front of a crowd. And I'm kind of weird. I was a theater kid, you know, okay. growing up. Yeah. So like, I would not really get the jitters in front of uh, talking in front of a lot of people. It's more so I get jitters hoping that I don't mess up. You know, for myself, yeah. I you know I, I don't want to watch back at a vod and and like get mad at myself for saying something that was incorrect or something like that. So I try to I'm very scientific. I try to make sure that I have all my data and I I say what's proper and what's correct. Um, but of course, you can't you, you can't be a robot on commentary. Like there's right. no way you could predict what's gonna happen. Obviously, so it was just more so not being afraid of a crowd or like how many people were watching. Just more so to know that I was able to be able to deliver my message in a better way that. I I would usually not be able to do if I was just starting out. And I got a lot of feedback my first time. I was not perfect. I learned what synergy was. See, with a, a co-commentator that I don't usually get to commentate with, because that was my first, I guess, gig. So I was put up with commentators that uh, I'd never had worked with before because I went from a local like three weeks prior to, wow, this is a tournament and it's a regional. And they had a big figureheads like Mewtwo King was there and uh, Static Manny and all these other people. And it was just a big deal uh, to be able to be at this regional and be able to see these top players and the audience react to the, what it was. And at the time, unfortunately, there was no other uh, girl commentators that were actually taking the lead for the scene. Yeah. Um, not too sure why. At the, honestly, I kind of just was like, you know, I'm having fun with the game. So, like, why not if I get to talk about it at the same time? Luckily, as time has passed, a lot more uh, women have been able to get up on the mic and actually share the same thoughts as I have. And it's actually really interesting to see how that's developed. But it was just more so uh, I was nervous, you know, because I didn't want to mess up. Not really because of the crowd. Uh, at the risk of sounding cliche, is it difficult at all being a woman working in esports? 
Um, it, it's got its pros and it's got yeah. its cons. Uh, I would say that there's definitely a lot of cons, but to ignore the pros, it's, it's absolutely silly. It's, there's definitely a lot of pros to it. Um, you, you, unfortunately the market is a lot smaller for women in terms of, uh, there, there's less of a pool for women to get picked from. So since, because of that, I feel like women, um, absolutely, um, are able to, uh, break their way into esports a little bit easier in my opinion. Um, but just because of the fact that there's a smaller pool, um, if that were to be increased and the more women were shown on, I feel like on the screen for streams and stuff like that, I think more women would be more inclined to want to commentate and that would increase, uh, just the talent pool that people could pick from, I guess, diversity, depending on what the streams would want. Um, but I feel like talent should definitely be right. overruled no matter what, because I feel like that's what really helps, uh, make a good example for people at home. But of course there is cons, you know, you have people that are already grandfathered in. Uh, women weren't really, I feel like women didn't really grow up on this now that esports was the is the way it is currently. I feel like uh, now is when more women are, you know, growing up to get more into esports because back in the day, we're talking like maybe 25, 30 years ago, uh, I feel like that was less common, at least when it came to esports, because esports didn't really even exist at the time. You know, yeah, yeah. it was just the thought and the idea of it. Yeah, the, everything was. It's crazy how fast things are changing. Because when I was a kid, it, it was sort of viewed as like embarrassing if you were really into PC games. Um, and things are so different now. And, and esports was almost like a a meme because it so much was not really a thing. It, it was like something people were trying to do, and now things are. Completely and totally different. It does seem, correct me if I'm wrong, it just seems like things are opening up more yeah. now and now it's just becoming more mainstream. And I, and I love that. I love it because, you know, growing up, I've always been really into this type of stuff. Uh, you know, being a professional gamer, that was always like the dream, you know, but esports yeah. wasn't, you know, established. <laughs> I wouldn't say esports wasn't even established until recently. You know, yeah. you, you, the, the idea of competition was there. Uh, music videos surrounding the idea was there. Um, and it just never really took off until more serious companies decided to invest into esports and it became public media for uh, the general media to consume. And I think that's what really helped it start off. And that's why we're able to cater to not just the generalized, uh, the, the men that grew up with it when they were little kids and stuff like that. Now it's for everybody yeah. to consume. And I think that's what's really different nowadays is that everyone has found a place within esports, no matter who you are. Yeah, that's that's kind of the cool, beautiful thing about this is that it transcends like age and, and gender um, everything, because as long as you are able to use your hands, you can play. Exactly. Exactly. There's no excuse. There's right, no excuse. right. So uh, you obviously are an expert in Smash, but are, are you very acquainted with other fighting games? Um, uh, not necessarily. I did see a, a lot of, I used to watch a lot of Street Fighter back in the day. Yeah. Um, but I was, was a Nintendo kid, so I was more fluent with Smash Brothers. Funny enough, it sounds super backwards, but I actually am way more fluent in uh, FPSs oh, than really? I am with fighters, yeah. Um, I was very big on Call of Duty, actually, for a long time. Um, I want to say my Modern Warfare 2 was definitely the game that like I grew up with for a solid like four years of my life, where gaming was really important to me. Um, that's actually where I got my tag from. I lost the bet. <laughs> oh, really? I lost the bet. It sounds funny because, you know, how will someone named Vicky Kitty get their tag from Call of Duty, right? It sounds yeah, like, yeah. oh, cute name that, you know, she wanted to pick. I actually <laughs> lost a, a bet to a, a, a player who their name was uh, Mr. Fuzzy Kitty. And he said that, you know, if I beat you in this quickscope <laughs> match, 1v1 classic quickscope match on, uh, on Rust, you have to join my clan. I was like, ha ha, all right, man. And yeah. I lost, and I stuck to it, and it's been over like 15 years now, and I, I'm still with it. <laughs> Wait, what is, um, it, when I look at Smash, um, first of all, I, I love the game, and actually all the people I bring on an interview, almost all of them talk about how they are huge fans, whether it's Melee or, or Ultimate. Um, people are just really into it, but it's different from other fighting games. Yeah. And I don't know if I'm wrong about this or right about this, but it does seem like it, it, it's a little bit more fractioned off from other fighting games, the community. Like, it could, what is your take on that? Um, it's always been in its own separate category, I would say, for the FGC. I, I guess it's because it was so pushed as a party game. Um, and that yeah. was kind of like the joke was like, oh, Smash isn't a real fighting game. It's a party game. There's items in the game. And, um, you know, unfortunately, since it wasn't taken so serious. Uh, it kind of like stayed as like a stigma. Yeah. Um, I would say that 
around the end of Smash 4 to now, especially with Ultimate, I think that stigma has shifted at least more than it used to be. Uh, seeing the entrances, I mean, look at Evo Japan, like you had over 3,000 people enter. I know it was a free to enter tournament, but that's still insane. You know, you have yeah. across the sea right now, you have Genesis going on, which I think has like over 2,000 entrances. So Ultimate Entrances is no joke. Uh, the game has been out for about a year now, um, a year and a month. And I feel like that should be a statement on its own about how serious the people take the game as, a, as competitors um, and where these competitors come from from all around the world. There's also DreamHack is going on currently in Germany, another Smash tournament happening over there. And I think when the FGC was able to see how serious people were taking Smash Brothers, I think they started uh, to lay off on the, oh, it's a party game joke. Um, it's still there, you know, it still kind of exists because it's not a traditional fighter, it's a platformer. Right. Um, it's not what you would usually see when it comes to Tekken or Street Fighter, but um, Smash is, is, is in its own category, and I would I would say that it is definitely a fighting game. <laughs> it's also, it seems like a lot of the people that are good at Street Fighter Tekken, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it doesn't seem like their skill translates over into Smash. I mean, Smash is, I mean, there's really nothing like it because instead of, just trying to destroy their health meter. You're trying to punt the other character off the screen. Mm -hmm. um, but I have seen that a lot of other players have not, who, who have been very successful in fighting games, uh, cannot switch over to Smash. It's funny because uh, there was one player in particular that you know everybody knows, Sonic Fox, who had made a statement about how he wanted to get into Smash Brothers. Um, I'm not too sure how how much practice he's put into the game. I haven't really seen him compete um, at all, actually, since Ultimates come out. But I I definitely understand what you're trying to say. Like that that is definitely been a, a trend that I'm seeing. But there have been other fighting game players that have been able to uh, play Smash, and although not be the best of the best or be top ten or even top fifty, they still do relatively well compared to the average smash player um you know you have people going 2-2 in their pools but i've seen really good dragon ball fighter players just come into smash and you know get out of the pools round one yeah and on average some people that have even been playing the game for more than two years can't even do that you know in other smash games um leffen i would say is a good example although he did start with melee is a good example of a, a player who has played a multitude of other fighting games and has been super successful in those fighting games what is it like um, covering Ultimate with Melee also always kind of in the background. I mean, there's a really funny... It's it's kind of a funny situation, and it happens every once in a while in gaming. Like, people are still playing Melee. Mm -hmm. This also happened with StarCraft Two when it came out. StarCraft One was so big in Korea. Um, and Blizzard basically assumed that there was just going to be a shift where everybody would cross over. And to their horror, everybody was just still playing StarCraft One right. in Korea. They, they already had the game that they wanted. Um, and Blizzard basically had to push to get StarCraft 1 taken off TV and StarCraft 2 put on. I mean, they had to strike up deals with these companies. And um, <clears throat> Nintendo is a company. I mean, I do empathize with them a little bit, right? I mean, they're they're basically saying, look, we're still innovating on Smash, and here's what we've made for you. But there's a whole group of people that are sticking with Melee. Um, what, what is your take on that? Um, Melee is basically the history of Smash, I would say. Yeah. That's the history of, of competitive Smash. Um, and people see Melee as like the golden game, you know, when it comes to when it comes to Smash as like the genius game. Um, obviously, there were glitches in the game that were never supposed to be in the game, but players yeah. were able to exploit that. And I think that's what the beauty of Melee is. It was a mistake that was never meant to be, but it became and it's still a, a very prominent fighting game till today. The viewership in that game is insane it, it sometimes it could even surpass uh, ultimate on good days yeah um and i honestly i'm happy that melee is, is a competitive game i actually wouldn't want to have it any other way um but i could understand why it's not the main focus that you would usually see on the spotlight you know pushing newer games is has always been what most companies would probably prioritize of course it gets the sales you know you got the systems coming through as well um but when it comes to Melee, you have legendary players that have established themselves and branded themselves all throughout grassroots. You know, yeah. you have Leffen, you have Mango, you know, you have HBox out there uh, making waves, Armada. These are legendary players that have not only influenced the scene for what it is today, 
but I feel like these are the players that, you know, you're like eight years old and, and you want to see what competitive Smash is because you somehow found it on the internet because, you know, the internet is accessible to everybody now, toddlers on their on their tablets and stuff like that. And you see something like that and you're like, I want to be like him. You know, esports is a thing. I want to be like him when I grow up. And you see how they're playing Melee. And I feel like even though it's an old game, there has been ways to play the game in, in a new way where it's not as hard. You know, you don't always need a CRT. There's there's different tools. That's, that's, <laughs> one, of the, <laughs> that, that's yeah, one of the weird parts yeah. about the game is that, it, yeah, you have to have a CRT monitor yeah, to play it. Yeah, I don't know. I, see, the thing is that there's tools that I know that the community uses to <laughs> not be able to just play on a CRT. There's like adapters and stuff like that. Yeah. But um, that's how they've been able to play on like newer TVs, and it works without there being any lag or anything like that. But that's like specific like tournaments. Not every tournament has that, um, and they're able to still play. And it's like one. Of, it's I feel like melee to to a lot of this the community is isn't just a game. It's like a literal lifestyle. Yeah. And I don't really know how to explain that because I'm not necessarily integrated in the melee scene like that. Although I'm very close to the players. I, the way they talk about the game and the way that I've seen them play the game and the way that I've seen them pl- try Ultimate, I definitely respect it. And it, it's it's definitely admirable. I've played Melee, up, again, as I said, growing up by myself. Of yeah. course, as a kid, it wasn't like anything like that where I'm exploiting any mechanics in the game. But, you know, recently, I have played with friends that are, like, are trying to play doubles and I have a good time. And obviously, I'm not as fast as they are. But to see the passion in it and to see how much fun a lot of people have there's a lot of technicality and i think that's why they still play melee cuz you're finding new things today despite that game being out for the last i don't know it's been like almost i think 18 years now yeah, or something yeah, like that so. it's been a long time but it's been so long and they're still finding new things in the game today that i think that's what keeps the game going i think that's what the interesting part of it is just finding something new do do you think there's ever a chance they could remaster melee and just put it back out i don't think so i don't yeah. know i don't know I don't, I don't think so only because why when you can make uh, you know the same characters and just uh if you want to add the mechanics make the mechanics and just add more characters what, what, what's your take on nintendo and, and their role in tournament organizing or i guess the, their lack of role um well they've definitely have been way more prominent in uh in having their hand in the scene now especially with ultimate they have their own uh, competitive twitter account they're constantly updating about the tournaments that they're partnered with. Uh, currently at Genesis, they're tweeting about what's going on at Genesis. Um, and they're talking about like professional players that are prominent players about like what's going on with their sets, um, where to find the booths if people are currently there. It's essentially a good public signal boost. Um, it's publicity. They're allowing uh, the general public who may not follow the competitive smashing be in tune to the smashing and live miraculously through that Twitter account. Um, and I feel like that is really a good stepping stone for them to get involved. Um, but it would be great to see something like uh, maybe integrate something in the Switch to see, like, you know, notifications about, you know, what tournament's happening near you or, uh, you know, big events to look for on our Twitter. You know, not even having to uh, say anything about, like, other players, but kind of, like, maybe boost their own Twitter account. Um, little things like that would be amazing. Them already getting involved, though, uh, publicly with, oh, you know, the tournament scene. That's amazing. Like I, I like that a lot. Um, it's better than what was happening. You know, five years ago, we wouldn't. Well, they really, were completely yeah, hands yeah, off. I we, think they were also. I don't know if they had a very odd take on esports in general. It seemed like. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not too familiar with their stand on it because I know there's a difference between, of course, Nintendo of America and then Nintendo in Japan. Yeah. Um. You know, the laws in Japan, the gambling laws, I know, are a little complicated to get around. Yeah. Um, I, I, if I understand correctly, um, first of all, like. Gambling is illegal, but there's yeah. legal ways to do it. Yeah. Where like, um, I mean, like how pachinko works. I, I don't quite understand. I tried playing pachinko like yeah yesterday when I when I came in, and I'm like, I don't I don't get this at all. But basically, like you can take the your balls or whatever and turn them back into money. And, and it, there's know. there's some loophole that they use to go around that. But basically, all arcades also have gambling uh, machines there, pachinko mm-hmm. machines or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so out here, they view. Uh, any kind of gaming where there's money involved a- as a form of gambling right. legally. Where in South Korea, they don't view esports as, as gambling. They it's view like it as a job. It's, it's like a competition. It's like yeah. a sport uh, in their view. So the laws are in South Korea are totally loose and, and relaxed. And there's tournaments every day for different games. But out here, it seems like it's much tougher. I, I wonder if that's, you know, because obviously uh, Nintendo Japan is, is the HQ. I wonder if that's where that attitude comes from is there was... 
I, I, I've never really understood, of course, there's a, there's an upper ladder thing and there's probably way more intricacies to, to why. Um, of course, you have to think about it too, like from a business point of view, you sit down at a meeting and you say to a whole board of members, all right, guys, we've got $100,000 on the table. What can we do with this? Do we put it into the competitive scene or do we put this into something else that we could do with it? Yeah. And I, I feel like... Nintendo's always been that family-based company, you know, the type of company that your grandparents would know about. You know, if you, yeah. you talk to your grandma and you ask who Mario is, there's like 95% of the time your grandma's going to know who Mario is. You know, my grandma knows who Mario is. That's yeah. that's kind of where I get the idea from. It's always been a, uh, you, uh, the big brother and the little brother get to play together. You know, it's a, it's not like you could unplug his controller and he could pretend like he's playing and you could pretend like he's playing and he's really not but they've always integrated it to be a family activity and they want everyone to ha- be involved and have fun. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I mean, if you look at Nintendo, they really have tried to make it so that everybody can play and the games they put out are, are very intentionally like innocuous uh, and gentle. Um, and I guess esports is sort of a very alien thing. Uh, I mean, but Nintendo's also had so much success with what they're doing because they don't seem, it doesn't really seem like they have that much competition. If if you look at like Xbox and PlayStation, they're they're trying to gear themselves more towards like hyper realistic, occasionally hyper violent um, games. Uh, whereas Nintendo, they've really mastered making a game that like the ten year old version of me will like as much as the thirty five year old version of me yeah. will like. Yeah, kind of touching up on nostalgia, I would say. Yeah. Um and. I think that's where the integration of like the whole family thing starts from. I mean, I grew up on Nintendo. That was the first system I even yeah, got to yeah. play with. So like being able to have that history and even looking at Smash, like being able to to have characters like Duck Hunt, you know, or Game and Watch or Rob even, and being able to have an older generation relate to those characters. I think that's what their goal is, and um, it's an interesting take because, as you mentioned, no one else is doing something like that, yeah. at least from what I'm seeing. And um, I wouldn't even say that, like, oh, Xbox versus PlayStation versus Nintendo. I don't think that's a competition. I think Nintendo is competing on their own away yeah. from that market. I don't think they they they're trying to focus on something like that when they're already have their niche in a different type of market where they're catering towards nostalgia and uh, trying to build up on that so that way, you know, your kids could grow up on that and your grandkids could grow up on that. And it's basically a whole generation of gamers to be able to play all together. Do you think there's more they could do for for Smash Ultimate? Because Uh, right now, um, and I've talked to a lot of different people in a lot of different games, even outside fighting games, and um, it's fascinating to see how some companies are really hands-on, like Riot with League of Legends. Uh, you look at Valve with Counter-Strike, completely hands-off. They want to let the market decide who's going to dominate. Is Nintendo in the right spot with how much they're doing or how little they're doing? There's, there could always be more, but they could also be doing less if they wanted to. You know, yeah. like I, I, this has always been a grassroots uh, like scene. It's, it's been like this forever. It, for at least as long as I know, it's been like this for more than like 15 to 18 years. Yeah. Um, of course, since like Melee, I guess I could confidently say, despite there being a Nintendo 64 scene too, uh, Melee was what really kicked it off for the grassroots scene to just put in their love and passion of Smash into the game. Um, there could always be more that could be done, but I'm honestly thankful for what they've been doing so far. It's baby steps, I see it as. Right. And if they if they could do more, seeing how esports, I think, as I mentioned, I think esports being relatively new in the public eye of the media, um, as time progresses, I think that's the only way that we could really tell what they could do. But as I mentioned, even things like publicizing tournaments on like the Switch screen, because the Switch has a home screen where you have uh, tabs of like latest news, and it's like on the left side, and it's like you know I I got to see Nairo, um, the top Politana player for Ultimate, who has a huge fan base on Twitch. Um, you know, being interviewed by Nintendo. Yeah. And, you know, seeing something like that as, like, you're opening up your Switch to play, I don't know, Luigi's Mansion or any other game, Pokemon now is super popular, and seeing that on your screen and being able to click on it and you're reading all this information because you could open it from the Switch, something like that for, like, you know, here's the terms happening around your neighborhood or here are the big tournaments happening this month. Uh, watch it here or anything like that. Public eyes, you know? It, you know, just because... All these other developers are are putting all this money into these games doesn't mean that money will solve all our problems, you know. Right. Just putting putting the game on the front page could even do enough of that. It it brings in more people, and in turn of bringing in more people, that brings in more money for the pop bonus. Yeah, Blizzard's uh, been doing this now, where like uh, tournaments are in in the launcher. Like yeah. you'll see that. 
but it's still not in the game, which I because I've talked with them um, and, and said, you know, when when my show starts in Korea, wouldn't it be nice if a little notification happened in in game? Because this sick. is something that's so weird is that you have to be so into a game that you then go out of the game and look up online what's happening and, and, and how do I find this where it's never connected inside. I wonder, though, if Nintendo is, is would be wary of doing that because if they're promoting a tournament inside, you know, let's say on the Switch, it notifies you when you're watching, maybe something happens in that tournament that they don't want to be associated with. Exactly. Stuff like that. Yeah, I think that's, again, like that stems from the whole family-friendly thing that yeah. I completely understand that approach that they're going for. Like, you know, what if the commentary is a little ratchet, you know, because it's, it's fighting games too. Yeah, you have yeah. to, so, you know, what if the commentary isn't up to par? Now, that would also come down to if it's a Nintendo-associated event, then everybody, at least in production, should understand how the rules work. But then third-party characters are involved with Smash. Yeah. So there's also copyright issues that it's not just Nintendo's hands to work with, it's just the other outside companies that have to deal with that too, you know? You have Square Enix with, with Cloud, Strife, yeah, you you've know? Got, you've got Snake from Konami. Exactly, and so yeah. I'm not too fluent with uh, the, the really strict legalities when it comes to that stuff, but I definitely know that, you know, there's instances where some uh, music in the game, like intro music, that let's say um, back in the day, I think it was... Um, I don't remember. I think oh, it was Cloud back in the yeah. day where I think in Smash Four his victory screen had to be muted because they oh, didn't really? have they, they didn't have the copyright for the music, like the tournament <laughs> specifically. Yeah, and if it was like a Nintendo sponsored event and that event didn't that specific event didn't have the copyright for the music, they can't play they can't play his victory screen. Yeah. So yeah. It, I think it, it definitely it goes deeper into the nitty gritty of like more than just Nintendo it's probably other outside companies too that have to say yes or no or how strict they are with uh the the music playing the characters maybe even being used maybe even certain skins as well like yeah. you know now we have even persona in our game so you never really know what is allowed and what isn't um because we don't we, the, the, it's not transparent to the scene you know you have to be right. up there and working within these companies to really fully understand like what is allowed and what isn't and also i think um in general, you know, publishers are so protective of what what they view as their game. I mean, if you look at a uh, StarCraft, I mean, the, the story it's like a hokey aliens versus predator story, right? But all the people that play competitively are not really that engaged with the single player. I mean, there's always been this weird thing um, in the in the past, especially where I would host an event and they would want to like incorporate some of the lore or these these characters in the single player and. That's not really what the esports people in StarCraft are that interested in. But, you know, they always want to try to pull that back in there. And I think that has to be way more complex for Nintendo because there's so many brands uh, that are also in there. Also, and I don't know if, if you have an answer for this, but it seems to be a uniquely Japanese thing with these companies that they are willing to have characters from different companies come into their games. Um, just yesterday, uh, I was talking to um, James Chen about uh, you, uh, Akuma. Is in is in Tekken like that's crazy, um, but it doesn't seem like other companies outside of Japan are able or are willing to do that. I'm not too sure yeah. about like what what the what the legal thing is about the companies in Japan and the companies outside of Japan. You know, like you see Blizzard, for example, like super into uh, just boosting the lore of of their of all their games. I would right. say. I mean, when it comes to, especially with Overwatch too, I see it prominently there. Even Hearthstone, of course, is, stems from WoW. Um, I think it, it gives players a feeling of relevance to the characters and just being able to like have, I guess, more enticed to the game as well. Um, you feel like some sort of a connection. I, I do feel that way with Nintendo characters, but not too sure how it works when it comes to third party characters and trying to put that on a screen. I could see so many like copyright issues being a thing and having to go over many mountains to like just try to get uh, maybe one soundtrack playing for a tournament. I checked my clock a little bit ago. I want to make sure you're not going to miss your cast. Oh, you have yeah. to go back on at five, yeah, right? Yeah, five today. Okay, cool. Um, thank you so much for doing this of interview. Course. I really appreciate it. I know you're very busy, especially when you're casting as much as you do in Evo. I, I, I'm really grateful you took the time it's, to do it's this. It's been really fun, though. Nonetheless, like just being able to see the talent pool of the Jap uh, the Japanese players here, it's just absolutely phenomenal. Like just so much talent to pick from. It's like you have top 32 here, and then that top 32 could easily be like. 
I don't even know. That top 32 could just completely get rid of U.S. if they wanted to in yeah. an entire tournament. I mean, just so much talent that you don't really get to see travel around. So that's honestly what's been keeping me awake from my jet lag. Yeah, and you're staying in Japan for extra time, right? Yes, I am. It's kind of like a celebration because I just finished school, so I could yeah. actually stay longer. So let's go. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, you. cool. Let's go to the uh, after show, and then we'll uh, yeah send you back to the tournament. Absolutely. All right, that does it. Thanks again for listening, and thank you uh, to Vicky Kitty for taking the time to sit down and talk with me. I know... Uh, especially as somebody who casts at events, having to, um, on your break time, then do more work to do an interview uh, is asking a lot. So I really appreciate her taking the time to sit down and talk with me. Um, Again, guys, stay safe. I know it's kind of scary right now with coronavirus. Make sure that you're washing your hands, that you're staying inside. Um, I know a lot of people out there are not making money. They're not going to work. Uh, Things are getting canceled everywhere. It's an especially hard time. But make the best you can. Um, I know I've been dealing with this in a kind of a weird way. I've been playing Plague, Inc. and watching uh, disaster movies involving viruses. I just finished Outbreak not long ago. And I'm going to watch Contagion coming up here. Uh, <laughs> do what you got to do to get through this. Uh, this podcast was produced by Mark Lentz. Music by... Oops, excuse me. This part... <laughs> fuck. Let me try that one more time. This podcast was produced by State... Artwork by Alarise, music by Mark Lentz. If you want to support this podcast, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash tasteless podcast. Special thanks to our top supporters, Seth N., Rohit Sambadi, and Charlie Sheever. I love you guys. We'll be back again soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>